Vietnam. Okay. Okay. Uh, now I present to you our next uh, presenter, Helen Shadow. Uh, Shalu. Uh, our presenter, Helen Shalu, is an experienced midwife with three decades experience. She has practiced both in the UK and in Botswana. She was a consultant midwife between 2000 and 2008. She led the development of birth center with strong belief in social model of care for women and the delivery of home-based midwifery. She had masters of medical science in 1999, PhD in 2016, and a supportive husband, two sons, two grandchildren, and a lovely It seems like we lost Orofemi. I think that he will be back just in a second. But the, and we also lost Helen. Just a second. Now she is in the hip lock back in. Um, I am not quite sure what happened to Helen and uh, Olofemi, but hopefully they will be back just in a minute. Okay, great Linda, but uh, it, we seem to have lost uh, Olofemi as well, so I hope he will be here just in a minute. Okay, Olofemi, you are here. I will... Can you please take over the mic? Hello. Very on Hello. Hello, Helen. Welcome. Back. I don't know what happened. Suddenly, Olafemi, I couldn't hear him. It just went dead this end, and we lost connection. I, I'm so sorry, but I'm here. Yes, and and actually, what happened it was that you both uh, was uh, shut out at the same time, both you and Olafemi. But I think you're both here, so we'll continue where we left both of you. So please, Olafemi, go on, and then we will give the microphone to Helen. Hello, Finui. Can you say something so we can hear that your microphone works? Shall I, I'll, t I'll type something to him. Yeah. Yeah, but otherwise, Helen, maybe uh, you can just carry on uh -huh. and then uh, and start your presentation. No. Uh, I I can't are recall. You? Oh, you are here. Are you? Okay. Can you okay. hear me now? Oh, sorry about we that. We can hear you now. Okay, let me present Helen Shallow again. Helen Shallow is an experienced midwife with three decades experience. She has practiced both in the UK and Botswana. She was a consultant midwife between 2000 and 2008. She led the development of birth center with strong belief in social model of care for women and the delivery of home-based midwifery. She had masters of medical science in 1999, uh, PhD in 2016, a supportive wife, I mean husband rather, two sons, two grandchildren, and a lovely dog. I hereby present to you Helen Shallow, and I hope you enjoy her presentation. Helen. Oh, hello um, everybody, friends and colleagues around the world. I'm so excited to be here. I hope we don't get cut off again. 
Um, I just wanted to say before I begin my presentation that I'm very mindful that my presentation is very focused on an English district general hospital somewhere in the north of England. And you might think that has no relevance to where you work. But I have noticed over the years that many people have looked to, looked to Great Britain for, for inspiration with regard to midwifery. And we don't always get it right. And we have problems that we are dealing and grappling with here. And that's why I did my PhD. So a mother says, I'm in labor. And the midwife says, no, you're not in labor yet. And the mother says, but, so the title of my presentation is, Are You Listening to Me? And it's a feminist participatory action research study. And it's about the interactions between mothers and midwives when labor begins. And I would like to thank Professors Ruth Deary and Mavis Kirkham for making this study possible. So now I need to learn how to do this bit right. Um, just a picture from my kitchen window where I was showing some Scandinavians that we too can get snow in the UK. But it, with my introduction, I'm going to give you a bit about the background to the study, the context of my study and my aims, an overview, and then very quickly I want to get to the findings. So, many women came to my clinic that I held as a consultant midwife or in my role as a head of midwifery women would come having made complaints to our service that and they would say they being the midwives they didn't believe me or they didn't listen to me or us and they said I wasn't in labor when I knew I was and then they sent me home again and one woman said and this for, for those midwives out there, this is a sort of visual representation of the neck of the womb, the cervix. And one woman said, when you're in labor, it's fine. But when you're naught to four, nobody gives a shit and you're just a pain in the bum. Why is that? Well, I wanted to find out more about why women were being turned away in labor. But before I could do that, I needed to set the context. And when you do a qualitative study, you really need to be able to describe where you're coming from in your research. So I haven't got a pointer here, but if you just follow me around from left to right, First of all, I looked at my own biography of becoming a mother in the 70s, and I compared that with changing government policy. And here in the, 19, late eight, the early 80s and late 70s, we had two key government reports that talked about the safety of hospital birth and putting women off having their babies at home. And then we had changing childbirth in 1993 that, that, that commended continuity of care for mothers and choice and mothers being in control. And alongside that, I looked at midwifery developments. How did midwifery respond to government policy? And then we could not, I could not ignore the political context because when Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in the 70s, was it the 70s? No, it was the 80s. Uh, um, we began to see the, the, the rhetoric, the talk about the business model, um, moving away from free health care to all, which we still have, but much more talking about um, money, finance, and more about business introducing business into the NHS. And alongside all of these contextual issues, I wanted to see how mothers expect... Thank you, Celine. That was the word I was looking for. Thank you so much. Neoliberal policies. Um, there were mothers' expectations and how they've changed over the decades. So a quick study overview my feminist, that my theoretical perspectives, that the, the way I'm viewing or, or viewed the research that I undertook is from a feminist perspective. And I saw Celine early on saying about uh, midwifery being a feminist issue. And Karen Gwilliland in, in New Zealand got up at the RCM conference last year and said to our audience that, that midwifery is a feminist issue. And I would agree it most certainly is. I also took a postmodern perspective and I'm happy for anybody to, to ask me any questions about that later on. My methodology was participatory action research, and I chose participation and action research for its collaborative and its emancipatory potential. 
uh, I wanted to include my participants in the research process. So I undertook a series of focus groups with mothers and focus groups with midwives and in-depth open interviews with mothers and with midwives. I, I then, um, sorry, let me just click this button again. Then before I, I got into any deeper analysis, we, I held a one-day workshop where all my participants came together in collaboration uh, in a one-day workshop where they looked at preliminary findings which I had put together through a series of coding exercises using an electronic en vivo program and I wrote a story it was called Jane's story and Jane's story basically was of a woman phoning in saying I think I'm in labor and she was put off and put off until such time that she actually gave birth unintentionally at home and the consequences of that for her and her family because those were the stories that I was hearing from mothers but also Jane's story also mirrored midwives accounts from their interviews so there was a mirroring of what mothers told me and the midwives what they were how they were involved in in those scenarios those situations and my deeper analysis, I chose a voice-centered relational method called the listening guide, which involves four readings of the transcripts. And I actually did a fifth reading of myself as um, and listening to what I had to say in the interview process, which is a very um, reflexive and critically reflecting on my part in the research process. So the aims of this study were to examine the experience of childbirth with specific reference to the factors that enhance or inhibit mothers and midwives interactions when mothers report the onset of labor. I wanted to raise awareness of the implications of unsatisfactory interactions and with both mothers and midwives explore how that might be improved. So I'm coming straight now to my findings and I'm aware that was a very quick romp through the design of my study. Um, I, when you're looking at your data, it just seems overwhelming and there's so much of it and it's not neatly packaged. But for a presentation, for the sake of a presentation, that's how I'm, you're, you'll end up seeing two tables here which look very neat but the actual process of it wasn't. So I identified three major themes. The first one was subjugating mother's knowledge. And in that I identified conflicted mothers. For example, one mother said, when I, whether I was dilating or not, I was in labor and I was in pain. Frightened mothers. I don't think you feel safe when you're sent home again. I didn't. And stoical mothers, mothers who said, well, thankfully, he was born healthily in the end, so it was a success story. But, and as the interview went on, mothers reflected long and hard on their birth experience. For example, when a mother would go on and have a caesarean section after being turned away and turned away after a very long lead into labor. And, and the more she looked at it, the more she began to question whether in fact it could have been different to the way it was. Very reflecting, deep reflective process during the interview. The second theme I identified was undermining confidence and generating fear. It was fear of uncertainty. For example, one mother said, I didn't have a clue what was happening as it was my first time. And another mother talked about her fear of midwives. And she said, you're in the hands of the midwife, so you don't want to miff them off. And miffing, the, miffing them off was a colloquial local term for, for upsetting the midwife. So if the midwife said, well, you're not in labor, you can go home, a mother wouldn't dare contest that or argue with that because she didn't want to upset the busy midwife. And she likened this to going into a restaurant and if you didn't like the food you'd be scared to say so in case somebody would go into the kitchen and spit into your soup and this is what she said and then there was fear of the future or I called it foretelling the future when when mothers would be told so the midwives would say I wasn't in enough pain and I thought gosh what is enough pain then 
and this particular mother nearly gave birth in the car trying to get back to the hospital after being sent home. My third theme was abandonment, unsupported, unexpected birth out of hospital. It was like there were three groups of women, those who were repeatedly turned away saying the neck of the womb's not four centimetres, you need to go home, and the trauma that that caused them. And then there were the group of women who arrived very late in labour and felt traumatised because although we would say that was great, she came in, she gave birth quickly, this mother felt, well, no, I didn't get any support, I didn't get any of the help that you said I would get throughout my pregnancy. And then finally there were those women who were told to stay at home and then gave birth unexpectedly out of hospital. And for one woman that was in the garden in sub-zero temperatures. So underlying this was abandoned babies. One mother said, I think the experience of giving birth unexpectedly at home affected my bond with her when I thought she was going to die. And abandoned mothers. One mother said, all of your deepest, darkest fears just go through your head. And abandoned to responsibility. What about the partners? One mother's partner said, what if something happens to the baby and there's no one there who can help? And this particular um, woman said of her partner giving birth, she said, I, when she caught the baby in her, in her bloodied hands, she described the baby as being dulux white, and that, that really frightened her, and she, really, she and her partner thought their baby was going to die. I'm, I'm happy to say she didn't. So superimposed on these themes that I identified was becoming other, mothers and embodied dissonance. And bear with me, because I'll come back to that. So I then turned to the midwives and asked them what they thought made for positive interactions with mothers. And I won't go through all this, but for example, a personal greeting, giving your name, a sounding approachable, um, being aware of your tone of voice and sharing your name and sounding focused. But I've put the clock in the middle here quite deliberately because time clearly became an issue for these midwives and, and lack of it. So here again is another neat little table with the themes that I identified. The first was interactions with mothers as distractions. What makes for satisfactory in interactions? We've seen, we've seen on that little chart before with the clock face. However, one, many, not one, but many of the midwives said it's having the time to listen and the time to focus in. And one, not, I keep saying one, but it wasn't one, uh, a theme running through the conversations and the focus groups was about the conveyor belt. And a midwife said, you don't get the luxury, that luxury on labor ward. And she was talking about the luxury of actually either being at home or being in a birth center where you could offer a lavender bath to a mother and help her to relax. And actually, if labor progressed, it progressed. And if labor didn't, the mother would work that out for herself. And another midwife said, they get bored of us before we get bored of them. Um, and this midwife here said she likened um, the labor ward to having a conveyor belt of mothers. And a lot has already been written about that. Now, we have a system called triage or maternity assessment unit where mothers cannot get to the labor ward um, without being seen and assessed in a triage unit. And this is what one, mother, one midwife said about it. She said, I hate it. Triage, I hate it. At best, it's tolerable. At worst, it's deplorable. And I didn't mention triage to the midwives. They wanted to talk about it themselves. But within this, 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 this situation where they're working in, a, in an assessment unit, where they're taking phone calls and seeing mothers at the same time, and there's mothers queuing up outside the door, midwives have developed a formulaic discourse as a form of self-protection. And I identified something called conditioned conditional responses. For example, well, you can come in, but if you're not as far on as and that's the, the magic four centimeters, you'll have to go again. Many of the mothers talked about that, saying, well, we, weren't, we didn't really want to go. We wanted to go in, but they didn't really want us to go in, because when we went in, they said, you're not far on enough, you'll have to go home again. And this was very upsetting for them. 
There was also an issue of non-reassuring reassurance. Many uh, mothers talked about midwives saying, well, that's normal. You're fine. Have a paracetamol and a bath. And I can't tell you how many times the issue of paracetamol came up in my study. And we, we're beginning to know more about the effects of paracetamol and the inhibiting effects on prostaglandin. So it really is an issue that we need to look at in this country. And of course, there's changing expectations. And one midwife said, what happened 20 odd years ago and what happens now is completely different. And in that context diagram I showed you earlier on, mother's expectations are often led by their aunts and their, their own mothers who are a generation ahead of them. And their expectations were that you did come into hospital. I want you to understand that this study is not about advocating that all mothers should come into hospital and stay there for as long as it takes to give birth to their baby. But these mothers were really not prepared. And, and the midwives, although they would say it was best for mothers to stay at home, actually that's not how the mothers themselves viewed it, or well, these mothers. Now the third theme was one to one or one to everyone or one to no one. In our NICE guidance, um, I, I, if you don't know what NICE is, I'm happy to explain that to you, but it's, a, it's a, an evidence-based, well, it's supposed to be, it's a body of so-called experts who put the evidence together and then come up with recommendations to standardize practice. Um, we have in, in our NICE guidance for our labor care that mothers should have one-to-one -one care when they're in active labor. The trouble is, when is active labor and who diagnoses that? So, mother, so midwives have developed a pragmatic approach as well in the, as a form of self-protection. For example, one midwife said, and this was a senior midwife, I can dip in and out and do the care and do the obs. You don't have to stay with a mother. But actually, I thought one-to-one -one care for a woman in labor means you do stay with her. And that's why care is continuity of care for women in labor is, is, is safe and reduces interventions. But no, this midwife on a label thought you can dip in and out, do the care, do the observations. You don't have to stay. Another midwife identified conflicting responsibilities. It's my registration. And if I let her in, I have to be responsible. And what she was talking about, if, is, if, if she was in a situation where she was already looking after a woman in labor, or maybe she had two women in labor, and there were only two midwives, if she took a phone call and a, a mother wanted to come in, she found herself being reluctant to just say, yes, come on in, because she would be worried that she couldn't do the observations that she's required to do, and she thought that put herself at risk. The final thing that many midwives talked about was cumulative unreasonableness. And what they were talking about was that after a woman's given birth, it's three hours before the paperwork is done. And I've, I've experienced that myself in practice, that the bureaucracy around paperwork in this country has just become totally um, unreasonable. So the overarching theme that I, I, I fell upon, or my aha moment, was midwives becoming other. And I want to talk about consonance and conforming, or cognitive dissonance and disruption. But before I just go on to that, this is a visual representation of a first interaction. It could be anywhere in the world. The first time you meet a mother and she's in labor, it's an opportunity to welcome her, to smile and make her feel relaxed, get her hormones going and help make her feel welcome and respected. And often that's an opportunity that's lost. For example, at the top line there, oh, she's not in labor, she's not four centimeters, so the mother will have to go home. But the mother's thinking, but I'm still in pain. I don't want to trouble you, but... And then, oh, it'll be ages again. You don't sound like you're in labor, so you might as well go home or stay at home. And a mother's saying, but I keep calm for my baby. And if it's like this now, what is it going to be like then? And then often on a labor ward in the UK, you'll hear a midwife say, oh, that was quick. She came in and she gave birth. That was great. But it's not always so great for the mother. 
as I found out um, in my study. Or you'll hear a midwife coming off the phone said, oh, we've just had another BBA, which is a baby born before arrival. And really not much thought about it, but actually the mothers feel abandoned, rejected, and very frightened. So another wee picture from my kitchen window to show you spring coming, and we've had a sunny day here in Scotland. But I want to just talk to you a little bit about cognitive dissonance theory, because I went, I had these themes that you, I've just talked to you about, and I thought, but there's more here, there's something else. And I talked to my supervisors, and they said, think about it more, Helen, think about it more. And the more I thought about it, one day I was having a conversation along the lines of, well, midwives don't come in to do a bad job, so why is a bad job happening? What's going on? So what is cognitive dissonance? Cognit cognition refers to the mental process by which external or internal input is transformed, reduced, elaborated, stored, recovered, and used. So cognitive dissonance results when there's a feeling of discomfort which leads to alienation in one of the previously held attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors in order to reduce the discomfort and restore balance. To give you an example of this, midwives tell mothers it's better for you to stay at home. Whereas mothers, actually, uh, some mothers don't feel that at this point in time. Now, if the midwife sends the mother home and she sees that she's upset at going home, then she has to reassure herself, well, it's actually better for you to go home. Despite the evidence, I mean, midwives themselves say that, well, it's better for her to be home because it reduces interventions. But the research has actually shown that staying at home for longer does not reduce cesarean sections, forceps, or vontus and medical interventions. What it can do if we provide support, and this is key, support for women at home to stay at home, it increases satisfaction. And that's really important. So to go back to the mothers and this notion of embodied dissonance and conflicted mothers, this is how I understood it. Well, they, the midwives, must be right because they know best. So they're restoring balance. And in cognitive dissonance theory, that's known as consonance. But hang on, I must be wrong because I can't know more than them. And that's that itch that needs to be scratched. That's that rub. It doesn't quite feel right because I'm still losing fluid. I've still got pains. I'm still passing show. And I'm feeling like this. And so I'm feeling embodied dissonance. I know they must be right. Many women talked about what, they, what was in my head. But what was in their bodies was something quite different, what their body was telling them. So I then found um, a definition of embodied cognition, which is the surprisingly radical hypothesis that the brain is not the sole cognitive resource we have available to us to solve problems. Our bodies and their perceptually guided motions through the world do much of the work required to achieve our goals, replacing the need for complex internal mental representations. Now, I would argue that in the UK now, we have two midwifery models or paradigms. One is the social model based on concepts of relationship, continuity, engagement, birth centers, planned home birth, caseloads, and midwifery-led care. And then there's the obstetric, or rather I'd prefer to call it now the industrial model, which is more technocratic, routinized, process-driven, throughput, clear the board, obstetric-led care. Yet the findings implicated midwives in both models in my study, and that was a surprise to me. So what's going on? Oh, I don't know. There seems to be... There seems to be something missing with this little slide, but it doesn't matter. Basically, we're trying to provide midwife-led care wherever we're working on labor ward or in a birth center or at home in the communities. But actually, there are things afoot that put barriers in place of midwives being able to do the job that they were trained to do. And this causes a high degree of dissonance or when midwives change their narrative to say, well, this is best for mothers, I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing for them, they restore balance and change their narrative in order to conform and comply to process-driven practices. 
So cognitive dissonance is caused by conflicting paradigms and that came through strongly in my study. And one midwife in focus group four said, I think as well it's going back, but it's kind of, well, the conversation as well. She's having a phone call and the midwife at the other end of the phone says, have you VE'd her when we're talking about late and phase mothers? Well, no, I don't need to VE -V her just yet. We're talking, we're chatting. And then you know we might have another phone call. And what's that mother doing? Have you VE'd her yet? No, we're talking about what's happening to her body. And another midwife in the same focus group said, but the trouble is they don't value what they're doing, what we're doing, do they? And I think as midwives, we don't value what we do either. And it's about time we did. But all was not well for midwives wherever they work. As a lead midwife on the labor ward, she found herself in an, and a senior midwife found herself in an impossible position. I asked her how this felt and she replied, it's frustrating, it's frustrating and at times it's frightening. There's been times when you're down to the last bed on labor ward, and I mean this is absolutely horrendous, down to the last bed on labor ward and going and waking mothers up at three in the morning asking if they'd like to go home because that's what you've been told to do by the managers further up process-driven care, clear the board. So how does it feel to work against your values and beliefs? This conversation occurred between um, two midwives. Midwife one said, it's crap, I don't want to work like that. I don't want to work like that on a regular basis. You know there will be days where it happens, What happens? that happens on birth centers as well. Well, what does that do to you, said midwife two? Well, the crap makes me feel like I'm a bad midwife and a bad person. Cognitive dissonance. And I don't want to do it. And then another midwife, midwife too, replied, well, it damages you as a person. And I would agree. I think it certainly does. And a midwife from Labour Ward said, yeah, there's no... Oh, sorry. There's... Sorry, I don't know what happened there. There's no job satisfaction at all. You don't feel like you're caring for anybody. You're not doing your role for anyone and you just feel like you're walking around apologizing and feeling guilty all the time and, and that you're not providing the care you want to give because you can't. You're spread too thinly. And by maintaining balance, consonants, midwives become other and they disconnect. I don't like how it changes how you are sometimes. You know, sometimes if you've got a lot of people on the corridor waiting, you've got all your beds full, you don't want to make eye contact with anybody. And meanwhile, in the holding pen, a mother described how then at about four o'clock my waters broke and I started to panic, so I ended up going down the corridor. Can I have some help, please? You know, my waters are broken. I don't know what to do. I'm really scared. Can somebody help me? And then the nurses came rushing back in and they get me on back on the bed and they check, right, we need a birthing pack now. And she hits the alarm button and all hell. It seems like uh, Helen Shallow lost her connection again. Hopefully she will soon be back. Uh, this is what sometimes happens. Um. Annette, I hope um, she'll be back. Um, this happens sometimes too. Uh, you hope what? I hope that uh, she will be back soon, but, but uh, she, she won't, it happened just before, uh, it is, I think it's, it is her own connection, but uh, I think she will soon be back. Oh, okay. So, um, okay. yeah. But uh, there is a discussion, interesting and good discussion yeah. going on in, in the chat uh, about the, the support. Yeah. Uh, the in labor. Her presentation has been very interesting and um, she has really opened up a lot of uh, discussions about uh, 
social yeah. model and um, that, that is indeed um, been presented as a very very um, superior to other models yeah. I hope she joins us very soon yeah Yeah, she is. She will return. So, you take over. Okay, she's back. Mm. Can you speak again, Helen? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, Technology is wonderful when it works. So here's an illustration of where those two models that are, I believe that we have in the UK at the moment, um, they can work side by side. When factors identify here dovetail and add excessive strain, there is a risk of creating the perfect storm. The impending signs are all identified in two UK reports, very damning reports about maternity services in the UK at this time. So if you look on the right hand side, the social model of midwifery, we have a situation here where in some hospitals we're taking staff away from birth centers or pulling staff from the community to work on short staff labor wards. And this destabilizes the teams. It, 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 midwives find themselves faced with unfamiliarity, insecurity, their confidence is undermined, there's a lack of trust, a loss of autonomy. Midwives are conflicted and suffer severe cognitive dissonance and safety, I would argue, is jeopardized. But from an obstetric or an industrial midwifery perspective, there aren't enough midwives. Throughput and clear the board are the priority. No time to engage with mothers. You just dip in and out. They manage rather than care. Midwives talked about rationing and prioritizing. They cannot provide real one-to-one -one care to mothers. And that leads to a lack of trust. Midwives disconnect in order to maintain a balance in their life so that they continue to work. But again, I would argue that as a result, safety is jeopardized. But I've argued that the obstetric model and the midwifery model can work side by side and should be able to, and I have certainly experienced that. But now we've got this neoliberal business model that's been superimposed on us. And I have this mantra that, 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 that we're talking about cost per case, efficiency savings, time is money, staff are to work leaner, meaner, smarter, keener, and do more for less, and at the same time, improve quality. There's inattention to real root cause analysis, and the infrastructure in communities is inadequate, and UK maternity services are then, I would suggest, outmoded. So findings from this study indicate that in both the social and obstetric midwifery models, there are barriers to affecting consistent satisfactory care in terms of emotional as well as physical well-being, situated as midwives and mothers are within outmoded, outmoded organizational structures. And I do have to say, before I do finally finish, that we, we have two new two government documents now, Better Births or two maternity reviews. One's called Better Births and the Scottish equivalent is called Best Births. And they are looking to the future and how we can provide continuity models, caseload models, and it's far reaching and, and really exciting. And I hope that we'll be able to put care in place that changes and transforms maternity services here, but we've yet to see it happen. So thank you for listening. It's just part of my, my study. There's so much more to say, but not enough time in, in this slot. But any questions, welcome. Thank you very much. Over to you, Olafemi, I think. Yeah, thanks so much, Helen. You've really presented very interesting um, uh, result of your uh, research. And I found out from your presentation that you have dealt exhaustively with uh, social obstetric and business model as it's been practiced in the uh, UK now. 
uh, you highlighted, highlighted a lot of uh, um, uh, discrepancies that occur uh, among these two models. You've really uh, done a lot of work on this, and from the chat, a lot of comments are coming in, uh, and I will quickly pick one of them so that uh, you can deal with it. Um, that's about uh, Becky from Virginia. I said, uh, can there be uh, the training of midwife assistant so as to uh, quickly provide care? Uh, Helen, will you quickly look at that question and please attend to it? Well, I th yes, I think it's an interesting comment. And, and from, from my heart, I, I can say that ethically, that is probably what we have to do. But professionally, it breaks my heart because I believe that is what the midwife trains to do. And when women come into midwifery, in my experience, that's what they want to do. I've just come from the student conference here, and, and it seemed overwhelmingly that that's what they want to do. So, yeah, I, I've got two conflicting thoughts in my head about that. Um, it seems to be that we get services ever cheaper, ever more on the cheap, if you like, um, because if you train birth attendants, doulas, and I, I, I don't have an issue with doulas per se because they do a really great job and that, that sounds really patronizing. However, I am concerned about the loss of the midwifery profession and if we don't address these issues now, then what is the future for midwifery? Oh, thanks again. Uh, coming from the chat again, selling ads, midwives can be considered as an oppressed group. Uh, from, from the two models, uh, three models you have uh, uh, explained, do you think so? Sorry, Olufemi, can you repeat that question? Sally said midwives can be considered as an oppressed group. So from the models you have presented, do you think it is correct to say so? I, I, I definitely believe that midwives, I think, I think midwives are an oppressed group. But I think that perhaps we, particularly in the UK, have brought that on ourselves to a great extent. We have signed up um, to the medical model and to extricate ourselves from that is going to take a great deal of work. So I, I, I think we have been an oppressed group. I think we are trying to fight back, if you like. But it, yes, Celine, how do you empower midwives? And I. I I always had this thought that, okay, labor wards seem to be process-driven, conveyor belt, factory-type places. So Marsden Wagner said, get mothers the hell out of labor ward. And hence my support for a social model, birth centers, and more home births. However, I can see that as long as we're employed by organizations who are driven by the business model, those pressures are still on midwives to do those quick community visits, to do those quick postnatal visits, to not promote home birth because there's not enough of you to do the on call. So it's it's very very difficult. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'm rambling. I'll shut up. Okay, thank I you, Helen. That, um, and, uh, girls. I think. Uh, maybe yeah. I was just He's saying, gone. Olufemi, Chatham yeah. girl uh, said our, our, our role has been reduced and reduced and we have nurses looking after women who have had surgery. We have had care assistants looking after normal deliveries. Our role is not being fought for. Absolutely. I'm totally with you on that one. Totally with you. I think if we don't do something now, then, then midwifery is little more than... Um, and I'm not denigrating the nursing profession. I've been a nurse myself. I'm not denigrating, but it's different. And um, how to empower midwives? Well, they need to, they need to, we need to be talking to midwives. They need to learn how to speak up. As you speak up, Celine, and as I speak up, we just need to keep banging on. And to equip midwives, I think, in their training, I think we, we need to equip midwives to be 
assertive and to believe in themselves. Okay, you, you talk about deep in and out. I think that can be dangerous. What do you think? Will women feel safe and usually? No. But what can, I, you, I, what, what I, what can I, anyone do about that? I profoundly believe that women do not feel safe. A midwife comes into her room, she does some observations of blood pressure, looks at the baby's heart or listens to the baby's heart, then leaves her again. This is profoundly unsafe. And the whole, the whole preface of a social model of midwifery and continuity of care models is that midwifery-led care is safe because we are with the woman. But if we start to translate labor ward practices into community settings and labor ward practices into birth centers, I think we are endangering mothers and endangering midwives because we will, cut, we will get into serious trouble. I don't think it's safe. So dipping in and out is not good enough. OK, there's this that came up in my mind. And, and on, on a lighter mode, I think uh, I, I would like you to respond to it. You said midwifery is a feminist issue. Can you explain better when men are sometimes there with, uh, with their wives, sharing the debates when they are delivering? How is it a feminist issue alone? Um, put quite simply, uh, I think Olufemi is uh, women's voices are not heard. Women's women's or mothers' opinions about their birth experiences are not generally heard. For example, the midwives, the, uh, the mothers I interviewed in my study were all women who had, on paper, they had a normal birth. So the the the. Their voices were not being heard, and it's, it's a feminist objective to, to raise consciousness and to raise women's voices, to make those voices visible and listened to, because what the women in my study had to say was very important. But because they had a, a, a statistically, they just had a normal birth, nobody was listening to them. So birth is a feminist issue because we're talking about empowerment. We're talking about enabling women to be in control of their own destiny with our support and our help. I don't know if that answers your question. It is a political position yeah, to take. So. Okay. Coming from the chat, finally, uh, uh, Selin said, it is an uh, epistemic uh, injustice. Do you think so? Where does it, well, I'm looking for, how, where's Selin's uh, epistemic injustice? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Mm. The, uh, definitely epistemic injustice insofar as whose knowledge counts and whose knowledge matters. Mm. And at the moment, it seems to be, even now, despite our moves in this country to have continuity of caseload models, it's only now that we're openly talking about that. But in the last 40, 50 years, the only knowledge that's been heard and count, counted for anything was medical knowledge. Have I, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, you can. Sorry, because everything went black here for a second, but it's coming back up again. So, yes, epistemic injustice. And I don't know if we're ever going to get justice for women around. Why, why are so many women around the world dying every, every day, every second due to childbirth issues? What's that about? And that, that, that's epistemic injustice. So, uh, Thanks so much, Helen. Okay. Thank you so much. That is all we can oh, take oh. for now. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I can't answer any more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll we need to do sum up the, the session. Yeah. Will you thank Helen all of me, or? Yeah, we, we appreciate you. Uh, we just appreciate your presentation. And um, you, you've uh, dealt so exhaustively with 
or all the models and uh, or the, the situation that women face uh, when, when when they deliver and, and and I really appreciate and I think uh, the entire conference participants have really been informed and um, they've been encouraged by your presentation uh, I really appreciate you for this and thank you so much Annette yeah, thank you very much, Helen, for a very interesting presentation. You can see that the comments uh, in, in the chat uh, has been very appreciative for, for your presentation. So thank you very much. Um, we um, would like you all to... to um, uh, I'll just turn off 